Welcome to the Practice You podcast. My name is Elena Brower. Together, we'll explore and enjoy content and conversations around mastering transitions. In our relations, our wellness, our careers, our families, and especially in our missions and visions. You are invited to learn and love and listen with me. Welcome to Practice You. Welcome back to the podcast. This is a beautiful episode, I can tell you in advance, because I am talking to dear friend, super smarty pants, Megan Watterson. She has inspired so much of my own study and work. Her studentship is among the finest I've seen in my sphere of people, and I have lots of really serious students around me. This human has written not one, not two, but three books. The first was Reveal, The Sutras of Unspeakable Joy, which I haven't even dived into yet, but I can't wait to. The second, The Divine Feminine Oracle, of course, which I own. And the third, Mary Magdalene Revealed, which is a new book. And this is the book that we're going to focus on in this podcast. Megan is a feminist theologian. Yes, you heard it right. With a Master of Theological Studies from, yes, Harvard Divinity School and a Master's of Divinity from Union Theological Seminary, Columbia University. Yes, did I say smarty pants? Megan facilitates the Red Ladies, which is a community of radical love that lets her preach about female saints and mystics and gurus and poets who inspire and teach us to live in the service of love. She leads retreats and workshops on Mary Magdalene's gospel and the soul voice meditation. Her work has appeared in media outlets such as the New York Times, Forbes, the Huffington Post, and Marie Claire. And she lives with her son. How old is he now? Nine. My gosh. (laughs) Very delicious this moment in time. And his exuberant goldfish, Bob, who is how old? Is he still alive? Yes, Bob is still alive. He is two years old. Oh, God bless. <laughs> Long life for a goldfish. It is. <laughs> I'm sure I had goldfishes switched up on me at some point in my life <laughs> when mine <laughs> passed away. Bob is somewhat irreplaceable. He's I would so, imagine. He really is. He, he kind of dashes around every time you enter the room. So he is, he is actually exuberant. He's showing up in your bio. So... <laughs> I'm just saying. Um, To you, and this is in the book, a feminist theologian, which is kind of my first question, but I found the answer in the book, of course. To you, a feminist theologian means that you believe that every human being is equal parts ego and soul, and therefore worthy of the same rights. You believe, as you're quoted in the book, I believe, you believe it would do it would do as much harm to call God mother as it has to call God father for countless centuries, and which perpetuates this misunderstanding that any one of us could be greater or less than the other. Yes. You feel it's important to keep expanding our hermeneutics, our vision of what's good or God, what's holy, what's sacred. And as we keep expanding that vision, you feel that is when, as you pointed out, the mystic William Blake said in The Marriage of Heaven and Hell explained, if the doors of perception were cleansed, Everything would appear as it is infinite. (laughs) I like starting there with this chat because we could go down so many rabbit holes of religion and teaching. And I mean, I definitely still want to talk about your experience of divinity school. I definitely want to talk about the codification of Christianity in the fourth century. I want to talk about your current lineage but I want to start with that sort of very expansive, nothing is right, nothing is wrong view. So Mary Magdalene, (laughs) when I, first of all, thank you for bringing her really so squarely into my life. When I asked James, who was my very favorite historical 
scholar when it comes to these things because he is a painting aficionado, to say the least, and he knows everything about Jesus Christ. (laughs) (laughs) All the things. Of course, I go and I have like, you know, Pamela Cribby's book and all the, anything I can get my hands on about Mother Mary, Christ consciousness. I have friends who are just embedded, steeped in Christ consciousness. So I have it all around me all the time. And I really appreciate it, even as a uh, growing up a reformed Jew. But when I asked James about Mary Magdalene, he said, well, it's said that she was a prostitute that, and that's, this was very important to him, but he said she was very humble and she would, it wasn't just about prostitution for her. She was, she realized who Jesus Christ was and she would wash his feet and she would learn. Mm. And I, that has to be my first question because I'm sure that there is some patriarchal something going on here when <laughs> that's the story that everyone has in their head. And it's the first <laughs> word that comes to everybody's mind. It annoys me. I know that Mary Magdalene was a teacher of, of such good wisdom. I know that she taught us to focus on the heart rather than the mind. I know that she was a repository in many ways for the wisdom of Christ consciousness. So teach us, teach me, teach my listener about Mary Magdalene and how this misperception of her happened. So it really is best to start with the the codification of the current version of the New Testament, like what what we would find now most readily. Um, Mm -hmm. That version was codified, which means it was decided which scriptures would be included in what would become the Christian canon. So it's really important to understand is that there were all these scriptures that were existing for hundreds of years as Christian scripture that then went under review. And among those Christian scriptures were gospels like the Gospel of Mary Magdalene, the Gospel of Philip, and the Gospel of Thomas. And these Gospels were very, very different. Um, They told a very different story than the master story that was created in the fourth century when at the Council of Nicaea, church fathers uh, gathered together in order to decide what would become, you know, what would become the actual New Testament. The reason why that council was called together was because Constantine, who was the emperor, the Roman emperor at that time, decided that this before very persecuted and struggling cult known as Christianity, um, if you were Christian before that point in the fourth century, you would be killed for being Christian. That's how radical it was. Wow. Because they believed we all have this intrinsic goodness that resides within us. We all have this capacity to be able to connect in a way where we are speaking from and existing from within the heart. And this included women, men, slaves, citizens. There was this very entrenched hierarchy of existence that that existed in the Roman hierarchy, the culture for the, for the Romans. It, it was, and I'm, I'm putting my arm up. You can't see it obviously, but mm. I'm, I'm putting my arm up and, and Caesar, you know, the, the emperor is up here at my fingertips and then a slave would be down here at my elbow mm-hmm. and all of the different rankings of human existence would go up. But men and landowners and, and men who worked in government, the, the literate um, were up there you know, up by my wrist and my hand. Uh-huh. And what Christ, what the, these early forms of Christianity that are exemplified in the gospel of Mary Magdalene, in the gospel of Thomas and Philip, what they said was that Christ came and now I'm putting my hand and I'm laying it across it, mm-hmm. is that cr- Christ wanted to suggest that actually you cannot rank existence according to a hierarchy that that has to do with the mind, right? The ego, that's not truth. 
that that intrinsically, which is is why so much of what he speaks about in these other gospels is this idea that the kingdom is within. It's not this external kingdom that's been created by the empire and that oppresses some and elevates others and says that some of us are born intrinsically more worthy than the uh, than others. And women at that time were considered less worthy than men, no matter what, whether they were slaves or they were owned by their husbands, whether they were educated or not, they were considered less worthy than men. So in these other gospels, Mary Magdalene is referred to as Christ Kanonos, which is Greek for companion or partner. Mm-hmm. So he, he considered her in some way equal to him, which was absolutely radical at that time, of course, because he isn't adhering to this idea of existence being ranked according to a hierarchy. Right. He's saying there is something about the way that Mary Magdalene was able to enter in her heart, enter into her heart and speak from it and act from it that allowed him to see her as his companion, as his partner, thus rendering them radically equal. Now, some of the other scriptures that weren't included as well, which I mentioned in Mary Magdalene Revealed, because, you know, they changed the course of my studies when I came across them in seminary. One of them is the Acts of Paul and Thecla, which the Greek version dates all the way back to 70 AD, which is earlier than some of the um, scriptures that was then canonized in the, the Bible in the fourth century. So the Acts of Paul and Thecla relate this Turkish teenager who most likely lived in the first century and encountered Paul. We all have heard, whether we're a part of Christianity or not, most of us have heard of Paul, but very, very few of us have ever heard of Thecla. But what the Acts of Paul and Thecla relate is that Paul always had a female counterpart walking with him, teaching with him, ministering alongside of him. They are buried next to each other. Mm. And Thecla refused to obey the dictates of what the external world, what the, what the Roman structure of hierarchy and culture would insist upon her as this Turkish teenager, you know, in the first century, she was supposed to get married and have children. And she, ref- after hearing Paul, she refused to get married. And then she ends up going through these various different trials and eventually baptizing herself. So she is this radical example of this form, this lineage of Christianity that existed before the fourth century. And then what ended up happening was when Constantine wanted to make this radical form of Christianity into the empire's religion and still call it Christianity, he needed it to more mimic the hierarchy of existence that was already in place. Mm. So the only ones to gather there to decide what Christianity was going to look like and to come upon a master story. This is what Dr. Karen King from Harvard describes what was created at that point. It was a master story, but it it's not accurate. It's not historically accurate because we knew from all of these other scriptures, that women had places of authority long before this master story was created in the fourth century. But the master story created the possibility for the apostolic, which is the apostleship, to be solely male from then on out. So Mm -hmm. women could no longer have places of and positions of spiritual authority from the fourth century on onward. And so gospels like, you know, the Acts of Paul and Thecla, or Mary's gospel, or the gospel of Philip, which says, you know, that Mary Magdalene was Christ's partner and companion, all of these gospels were not included and were from that point forward considered heretical. And by the end of the fourth century, an edict went out for all of those gospels to be destroyed. And then what happened was by the sixth century, Stories about Christ became increasingly divine. You know, he his humanity was erased and his he was more 
the incarnation of God, but without the aspect of him that was also human. And Christ became more and more divine and Mary became more and more and more human until the sixth century when Pope Gregory in a homily, a defining homily, um, homily 33, he announced that the penitent, the faithful should refer to Mary Magdalene as the prostitute because he conflated different scriptures and assumed that the woman who had the seven demons excised from Christ, that Christ had excised, that woman was Mary Magdalene and the seven demons meant, oh, she must have been, that speaks to her sinfulness and the sinfulness because she's a woman must have meant she was a prostitute. There is absolutely no historical evidence that she was. The opposite is true, um, that she was a, uh, a Jewish woman from the town of Migdal on the Sea of Galilee and was highly educated and was most likely a benefactress of the early Christ ministry. That's what we know historically. But what happened was that homily took off like wildfire. Number and, 33. Yes. And she, she, you know, her story was then reframed and retold so that the emphasis would be on women, their bodies, their sexuality, their sinfulness versus Mary, the focus of Mary Magdalene and her sp- spiritual teachings and her authority which was so evident in these other early Christian scriptures that were then ordered to be buried or erased. Well, they were ordered to be destroyed, but fortunately some refused that edict and they buried her gospel instead. A couple things arising from that. First of all, Thecla, T-H-E-C-L-A. Yes. For those who want to look this up, she, she ended up, uh, walking and teaching alongside the apostle paul right she wore robes like he wore when she was spotted by i think it was alexander if i remember yeah. in your book yeah yes. who wanted her mm-hmm. he tried to buy her from paul right paul denied any knowledge of her why did he do this <laughs> was he was he just putting her to the test could she defend herself what what was that about I, I think he was protecting himself. I see. He would have been um, an enemy, considered an enemy of the state, and it would have been possible for him to be put to death as well if it was found out that he was a Christian. Because again, at that time, it was... Because as a Christian, not only are you defying this idea that we should be ranked differently. Hierarchically. You know? Right. Not only are you defying that, but you're also defying the idea that the emperor is the ultimate being within that hierarchy. Cause you're saying there's actually something that is more than the emperor and that something exists within us all and is something we can all connect to. So it just turns that whole hierarchy on its head so that the first becomes the last and the last becomes the first. So he was most likely, you know, trying to play invisible. And was deflecting any attention that might be brought to him. But Thecla rises to that occasion and she refuses to be taken. And she tears his gowns and she rips his crown from his head, which was very shaming. She publicly shamed him. And so this is when she was put to trial again by um, he ordered to have her killed in the arena for doing that. And she ended up... Naked with the word sacrilege across her chest. Yes, yes. And, Which, uh, and they, they get a lion to kill her. Yes, and the lion bows before her. Approaches her. Can you imagine? I love what you wrote in the book. You wrote something like, I wonder what she must have done with her eyes or something like this. Yeah, well, courage meeting courage. Oh, you know? Yes, 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 yes. The love that floated between them because, you know, this idea is also that the, the first scripture that we have remaining because the gospel of Mary Magdalene was pages that have been torn from it, even w- once it was saved. But one of the first lines that we have is Mary two, two. And it says every 
nature, every modeled form, every creature exists in and with each other. So there's a practice that can flow between, you know, beings that can flow between the existence, you know, from heart to heart that I just imagined, you know, courage meeting courage in that way. But that's the form of Christianity she would have been embodying and practicing in that moment. And of course, what it did was allow the lion to become her protectress. And so the lion kept her alive. Right. And so all the other animals that they subsequently sent in to try and destroy her were actually destroyed by said lion until the crowd began to turn and see that she was in fact very powerful. Yes. And not a force to be reckoned with, basically. Yes. And I'm getting chills right now because the, the first time I read this scripture, when I sobbed was when I reached that part where the Acts of Paul and Thecla says, all the women in the crowd cried out in a loud voice as if from one mouth. So it was the women, which if you remember the structure of the Roman hierarchy are considered less worthy, are considered less powerful. They join together and they scream and refuse to allow Thecla to be harmed as if they are one, right? They unify their voices and scream out as if from one mouth. That I, I just, I got chills and I get chills every time I speak about it because that's That's the power of the force, the love, the energy that this early form of Christianity is speaking of. It's a power that goes beyond the egoic ideas of what it means to be human, of what it means to be male, or what it means to have a position of authority. And it says, you know, there's a power that exists within me that is so much stronger and ancient and like fire itself. And if we harness it, you know, in, in the face of injustice, like they did, they really saved Thecla. And then she saves herself. You know, she realizes because she had asked Paul to baptize her before that moment. And Paul was like, nah, <laughs> maybe later um, and doesn't baptize her. And so in that moment, then after the women, save her, they start to throw cardamom and nard and all these spices that lull the rest of the wild beasts into a stupor. And so there's water within the arena. And Thecla says, in the name of Jesus Christ, I baptize myself. And that is so incredibly powerful because that is someone who does not have power, according to this hierarchy, initiating herself and saying, actually, I I know I am worthy. (sighs) I think I have to do that every day. (laughs) I definitely did it this morning. (laughs) I love that story. It gets me so riled up. I know. It gets me so riled up. I start to sweat. My heart's beating like crazy. I love that story. I love that story. Picturing the two of them looking at each other. (laughs) What's the relationship, therefore, of the story of Thecla, the apostle, and Mary Magdalene? So that form of Christianity, yes. you know, that, that, that lineage is, is reflected in Mary Magdalene's gospel. Nice. It's, it's, it's a, an understanding of a love that renders us all equal. And so this is the, you know, the subtitle to my book is the Christianity we haven't tried yet. And so the acts of Paul and Thecla would be included in that long right. list of oh scriptures that then weren't included in the codification of, of the Bible in the fourth century. Got it. Okay, got it. So then when we talk about this sort of veiling or hiding or attempted destruction of Mary's gospel, mm-hmm. First of all, the fact that she was able to take the teachings that Christ had given her, note them, and cause such a a fervor that they were ordered to be destroyed, and then the Egyptian Christians refused to destroy them. 
Right. And instead buried them by the Nile. Right. Tell us about what is in Mary's gospel. What is found? What do we recover? What are the teachings? So I would say the most important aspect that her gospel reveals is that Christ called us to become true human beings and that that expression, you know, translated into the English isn't very clear. What if we go back to the original Greek of what that's translated from, the word is anthropos and that word means fully human and fully divine. And what her gospel relates is that we are meant to be both. Mm. That we're not we're not meant to try to transcend or numb or uh, bypass any part of our humanity. Being human is the whole point. However, at the same time, and also we are this soul, and we are a soul of love that exists within us and that we have access to from within the heart. So one of the the exchanges that to me was so riveting and was a large part of why I just dropped anchor with the gospel of Mary and devoted my life to it was that this gospel contains an ancient dialogue that Mary Magdalene has with Christ. And she asks within it, you know, when I see you in a vision, she's asking Christ, how is it that I'm able to see you? You know, how can I perceive you? Um, with what aperture? Like, how is this possible as a human to, to perceive another from within? And Christ, she says, is it with the soul or with the spirit? And Christ says, it is neither with the soul nor with the spirit, but with the new, that's the Greek, N-O-U-S, that exists between these two. And that is what, and then three pages are torn from her gospel. So he was about to explain exactly how we can receive a vision from within or directly connect to the divine from within. But that word new, N-O-U-S, that Greek word, translates as the spiritual eye of the heart. And when her gospel picks back up after those three pages are torn out, she is going into the details of what Episcopal priest and scholar Cynthia Bourgeau refers to as the egoic operating system, which to me is just such an absolute relief to read the list of. There's seven of them. There's seven egoic powers. And they're referred to simply as powers. These are the aspects of what it means to be human, right? It's like the ingredients label of what it means to be human. They are powers like rage, right? Which we can all identify with. Of course. And and ignorance and a, a sense of craving, right? From within the body. So she outlines all of these and and then also explains the way that she was able to free herself from them. So she talks about this practice of being able to return to the new NOUS, the, the, the spiritual eye of the heart, which is what she's revealing in her gospel Christ gave to her. This is how he explains to her that she's able to see him and also subsequently how he's able to receive right directly from the divine within him. So first of all, I just want to point out to the listener, the, this whole matter is sort of addressed in the early hundreds of the pages of Mary Magdalene revealed, just in case you want to go looking once you get your book, page 105, 107, um, how crazy is it, first of all, that new, N-O-U-S, is also the word for we? Yes. En français. Fait, we. <laughs> like like you and that. me, us together, new. Exactly. That's crazy. Yes. The eye of the heart, us together. This is we. This is, this is, that's just bonkers to me. Yes. Um, when you started to work with this and learn about her. How old were you? Um, I would say in my teens, I, I started to become fiercely curious. I 
I initially left the church much younger than that, probably around 11, when I encountered the Bible for the first time and broke out in hives, <laughs> which is, um, I can say now, is, is very much an adage, a truism that I repeat, which is the body never lies. You know, my body was not lying in that moment. There was something for me that felt missing, but even dangerous about encountering that that representation or misrepresentation of Christianity. And um, as you started with my vocation or my calling as a feminist theologian, that that moment for me with with my body being so loud and so true and erupting in that that way was really speaking towards the erasure of women's voices, the erasure of the female embodiment of connection, enlightenment, that is so important, is so integral for us to be able to vision and imagine. Because for me, I have always deeply believed and I have personally experienced that our ideas of the divine directly affect the status of women the world over. So that erasure to me was a dangerous, uh, that was a dangerous endeavor um, because I knew it translated in misunderstanding the worth of women throughout the world and throughout history. Wow. I don't even, I don't even know what to, there's nothing to say. It's just all falling apart as we speak f from there, basically. I'm obsessed with the, I think this sort of falls into this moment, this segue, the power to judge page 116. Yes. It's like the perfect segue because it's a solve to what's happened to women. We were judged unfairly. It happened, it started to happen so early, all the way back then that we're speaking of now. And it is embedded in this judgment of us. And this erasure is ignorance. Yes. And when you talk about this Ignorance, as Mary says in 9.8, ignorance calls the soul bound by wickedness. And I know you said in the book, it makes you laugh. I, I've just opened to this page. It makes you laugh. It's what makes ignorance ignorant. <laughs> <laughs> it calls out in others what it cannot see in itself. Ignorance, you say, is the frame of mind we enter into when we have so aligned with the ego that we think we're in a place to judge. Right. Most often, if we are judging someone else, we are also doing a number on ourselves, quietly pouring corrosives into our heart with words that judge where we are on this path. Right. It's another word for ignorance, which I think is important to point out, is unconsciousness. Right. And I think that this has happened, this erasure, this unconsciousness, around women and our power has happened for too long. It's yes. still happening. It's reflected in the state of the world. It's reflected in the heat of our planet. When you think about the planet, if you were looking at the planet from the perspective of Chinese medicine and all the heat that is bubbling up, literally bubbling up, there's such a lack of yin respect, feminine respect. And that's why all of this heat is happening. We have got to stop, as you say, the judgment by first stopping oppressing ourselves. Right. Or we continue the work of the oppressor. Exactly. Yes. We silence ourselves from within before we even dare to speak. Yes. And there's no judgment for how long each of us needs to stay silent. It has taken you years to write about Mary Magdalene because you constantly judged everything you wrote is not good enough. 
this power to judge keeps everything in its fucking place and keeps us small, keeps us bottled up, keeps us contained and restricted to the same pathways. And so when it comes to this matter of erasure and the depth and the seriousness and the tears that came to my eyes when you were saying it, the silence that I couldn't even speak afterwards, this power to judge, we have got to overcome this. Yes. And when you move on in the book, you go, <laughs> the next part, you talk about the, the peak in Glastonbury, the Red Spring. I've yet mm. to be there, but boy, oh boy, have I heard all about it from so many of my very respected and dear women friends. The way that you talk about, I, I want to point out for those of you who have been to Glastonbury, the way that um, Megan talks about her trip there into the altar, page 120, 121, she's there with uh, Kate's mom, actually. Yeah. Right? Christiane Northrop. Yeah. And um, the way you described it, like... Would you die if I read a little bit of it? <laughs> no. Okay, good. Maybe resurrect, but I won't die. <clears throat> okay, good. Um, first of all, your description of it made me feel like I felt when I was walking into um, Guru Mai's meditation cave for the first time. Mm. So mm. sweet. So, so sweet. You got a tingling sensation. You say, as if a sudden effervescence flooded me, like my blood was now carbonated. Something was happening. Something was releasing through my pores, a belief, a misunderstanding, an ancient fear that I am safer if I silence myself, that my soul voice is dangerous, that I am safer if I just hold it there bound within me. You then reference Mary 914, and this is for several of the women that I know and love. You know who you are. I have been bound, but I have not bound anything. (laughs) this soul in Mary 914 is telling us what happens to us from a medical metaphysical perspective. The soul is bound by the egoic operating system. As you said before, it's bound by the powers that make us human, but the soul in turn binds nothing. There's no constriction when it comes to the soul. Nothing. Yes. Only fear. Fear is the only thing that can bind. The, the secret here in this, passage that the soul reveals to us is that the soul says it isn't recognized by the powers of the ego. Right. That's what's so funny. We have a responsibility to make sure that we are constantly prioritizing the soul. Right. And learning to see it and to recognize it. Yes. And to, dis- to discern when we are neck deep in one of these powers of the ego. Yes. These contaminants, pollutants in the sutras, in some of the most important sutras, they're just identified as pollutants of the mind. Right. And they go straight into how do we find the way to the heart? Dismantle these pollutants and move forward from the heart. Exactly the same teaching. Right. 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 And then the effort is to bring love where it has never been before. Right. So it's, it's, it's not to judge the fact that you found yourself in the power of rage again. It's not to judge it. It's to experience it and see it, to acknowledge it. I am enraged. Mm. However, we don't want to act from the egoic state. We want to see it for what it is, a power of the ego and bring love to it, right? So awaken, if we were unconscious in that moment, awaken from within that state of rage, bring love to it, which allows it to release. We bring the soul to that moment and we awaken. And and so then because we have seen that rage, we can also identify with why we we are angry, but when we act, we can act from that place of having returned to the heart, you know, because the injustices that are going on in the world, of course, they're going to enrage us because we're not separate from it. You know, we are a part of it, of, of whoever is being harmed, but we want to move once we've returned from the return to the heart and we've identified, okay, this enrages me that child trafficking still exists. This enrages me 
because I am human and I am meant to be enraged. However, the action I'm going to take is when I return to that state of heart, to that spiritual eye of the heart. So when I move, I'm moving in the effort of that knowing that I am connected to every child right now who is currently still being trafficked. And I'm, I'm moving from that place of love. And my actions are based in love. They're rooted in the heart. And what can I do proactively to support the rescue mission, the rescue efforts that are going on all the time? Exactly. Exactly. That's, it does freak me out to see people who are, um, oh gosh, I see it all the time. People are picking on other people for, for choices that they've made when there are so many more large issues that we have yet to address that we need to address as a community. Yes. Yes. That's, you know, that's ego speaking to ego. And, and it's so important to not get triggered or pulled in or hooked, you know, when someone is reaching out to us or trying to communicate to us from their ego, Mm. because we can feel it. I mean, you, you, you know it, the body never lies. You can feel it. But then when we can transmute and, and we're all, we, we all fall into these powers or under or be combined by these powers. But when we're able to transmute it and then communicate again from the heart, it's soul to soul. There's this Latin phrase I love, cor ad cor loquidor. And that's the ideal. It's, it's heart speaks to heart directly, right. you know, which can only happen when, when someone is listening deeply, when someone is doing the work to return again and again to this state of heart, which we all have the capacity to do. Every day, a resurrection. Yes, yes. Not just once. (laughs) Every day. (laughs) But every day, multiple times, a constant return, a constant arriving. Yes, yes. The last couple questions that I have before I ask you my sort of three typical questions of every guest. The trip that you took to the crypt in Saint Maxima at the south in the yeah. south of France. I've had a few friends take that trip and I was really riveted by your recounting of that trip. Is there anything that you I know I am definitely going to go there. Um, mm. anything that you would like to share from that trip? We're looking at page 155 in the book where uh 927 is the scripture that you reference at the top there. The soul replied saying what binds me has been slain. Yes. And what surrounds me has been destroyed. Yes. And my desire has been brought to an end. And ignorance has died. Yes. So the 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 crypt where I entered is it's it's very cold. No matter what time of year you 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 go, it's it's very cold because it's it's incredibly ancient and it's beneath the the church itself. And they believe that that is, or they have revered the skull that they have enshrined in gold, um, is Mary Magdalene's skull. And that moment was powerful for me because I. Uh, practiced the soul voice meditation as I was kneeling before the that skull. And what I heard was to walk with me is to walk as me. And that was a powerful statement for me to integrate because I think that tendency to want to put someone else as higher or more worthy than me was still very much entrenched in my, in my being. And until that moment, I really, I really hadn't been able to fully grasp or, or if this makes sense, I couldn't locate it within my body. It was like a, it was an idea. Yes. We, we are all love renders us all radically equal. It was an idea, but until that moment, I I couldn't, it wasn't an actual experience. And then when I heard to walk with me is to walk as me, I understood that, you know, I was still doing it. Even in that moment, I was seeing Mary Magdalene as greater than or, or more advanced or higher than I was seeing a whole host of people, you know, in, in my life as 
greater than or more worthy than than me. And in that moment, it was as if all those illusions came crashing down. And and I could, when I opened my eyes, it was this sense of really seeing and feeling, you know, being able to locate it in my body, this radical idea that love renders us all equal. It it was it was transformational that moment. Mm. I find also that when you, <clears throat> when I've heard people telling the story of going into this crypt, it's similar to the tour in Glastonbury, the the well that you were at uh, with the Vesica Pisces on top. It's similar yes. to, anyway, Guru Mai's meditation cave, even um, the meditation cave at the Himalayan Institute. Um, it's kind of all similar where you, you walk into a place where you expect to set somebody higher than you, you expect to want to bow and right. be deferent, be reverent. Right. And all that happens is you get sort of knocked over by the teacher, by some form of the teacher or the teaching where you are forced to remember that you are the keeper also of the keys to walk with me is to walk as me. Right. And it, it happens anywhere where there is real gravity, mm. uh, you know, teaching. It's not about the teacher. No, it's that unit, unit of state that we all can enter. And that mistake is made a lot where it's the teacher that gets the, you know, the, the weight of the keys. It's really not that. Mm -mm. No. So I have three questions that I ask of every guest. First, what in your life or your space needs healing right now? Oh, uh, I would maybe say worth. I think, I think that's something I continue to work on and to embrace and to allow those I love to reflect to me that sense of worth, um, which you know, also comes up at the end of Mary's gospel. Peter can't believe that the teacher has given Mary a woman, right? Mm -hmm. So someone who's beneath him in that hierarchy, that he's given her special teachings and not to him, a man. And and then Levi says in, in her defense, if Christ considered her worthy, who are we to disregard her? So that sense of worth and my... I'm certain my own sense of calling to this gospel um, and my own personal life is, is surrounded around that word worth yeah. and embodying it more fully. When you get finally, I'm going to ask you the other two questions in a minute, but when you finally landed at that place where you saw the, um, the little statue where her head is thrown back in the crypt, mm. Mm -hmm. And you put all your prayers around. Mm -hmm. And I remember, I, it's like I, it's like I was sitting there with you. Mm -hmm. you put all your prayer, you wrote your pr love notes and prayer notes for all your friends. And then you recall number 29, gospel 29, where she says, I will receive rest in silence. Mm -hmm. Where the war, you say, within her has come to an end. Yes. The bliss that comes after the demons, the powers, those loud egoic voices have been overcome. The rest comes yeah, because she knows herself completely. And she knows that this quote unquote silence within her heart is the treasure. Yeah. That this is where she can rest in love. It's not about taking a nap, dude. <laughs> <laughs> it's about <laughs> resting in trust that you are worthy you are fine you are you do mm -hmm. not need to worry about anyone else's perception of you you just have to work with your own mm -hmm. it's such a gift like it's just tucked in there on page 169 but it's <laughs> such a great that's like a circle and an underline and a folded uh, you know <laughs> That's, I love my book I, I did order those other two copies by the way I'm going to give them as <laughs> gifts to listeners I'm excited um, the second question, what is your favorite view? 
my favorite view. Yes. Actually, I would say right now it's it's the view I'm looking at right now. It's it's out over Lake Erie. My apartment looks out over wow. Lake Erie. It's sort of my I, I wrote the book here and um I always sort of pictured Lake Erie as my own little uh Sea of Galilee. Uh and kind of pretended that Cleveland was, you know, a modern version of of Migdal and <laughs> great. and the the water, the expanse, you know, that the horizon, there is no end to to the water. It just it feels it's very good for me as a writer. Beautiful. And then the last question, what does prayer mean to you? Oh, that's so gorgeous. So prayer for me is um, the effort of going inward to the heart. So further in is farther up. So rather than this idea or effort of prayers going, extending outward or going up and beyond, I prayer to me is that return to the heart and then a deep listening. You actually mentioned that uh, in your interview with Kate and Mike about Gnosis, G-N-O-S-I-S. I think you said something about the path. Yes is inward. God is within. It's the same in the sutras. Like I just spent a whole week teaching on those. It's the same exact concept. Probably all the religions have the same thing. God or whatever your conception is of God is within you. Right. That's the inward truth. And it's funny that it has all these words and well, and what's so powerful about that Greek word, gnosis, is it's also saying that it's experiential. So the body is included. That to know yourself, to go inward and to know God is an experience. It's something that, that happens here in, in this body within this heart. And I think that is to me, so gorgeous and needed and inclusive um, and crucial to understand that the body is is not an obstacle, but a vehicle to be able to experience what we understand to be God. I'm so grateful. I am so grateful for you and your deep listening. I learned so much reading this book and I'm going to continue to do so. I'm bringing it with me on retreat, by the way, so that I can read from it when, uh, when we're practicing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I love you and I love your work and I cannot wait to talk to you again. I love you. Thank you. Thank you, lady.